This little silver box up here is the SonCos LAQXD1. Well, that's quite a mouthful. It's one of a wave of recent inexpensive digital to analog converters from China. Now recently, of course, we checked out things like the SMSL M200 and its bigger brother of the QXD1, which is the SGD1. More and more letters in there for you. And we'll also be checking out the SMSL SU9. But at $200, how does the little DAC compare to others and, and how does it stack up? Well, that's what I've been checking out. the LAQXD1, well it's actually quite a small device. I mean it's not very large at all. And that's because of course it doesn't have a power supply. Unlike its bigger brother, the SGD1 which has a power supply built in, you have to provide your own power. But first let's have a look at a little bit of a look at the controls on the front. You have four buttons and four LEDs. Now the buttons don't correspond to the LEDs which confused me a little bit at first. They actually have, you have two volume controls in there because this has preamp functionality built in and then you have things like controls for the mute and power and settings depending on which button and how many times you press it you can change some of the settings of the DAC. I'm not going to go into super detail on that I recommend looking at the manufacturer's website and reading about it to find out all those details as it will kind of be wasting my time just repeating what's on the website in a video but all it's a little bit confusing so it does take a couple of tries to sort out what's going on with the LEDs and the settings. One one of the things that's notable is that it starts with the volume at its lowest setting, not full volume. Just like the uh, SGD1, which confused me a little bit at first with the volume starting at essentially zero, you do have to turn the volume up at the start initially. But onto the inputs on the back, as I said, actually power input is via a USB-C port. So if you have something like a, a 5 volt 1 amp charger, such as an iPhone charger, which is what I used for powering this, that will be ideal. Now the iPhone chargers actually is something I recommend. They tend to be low noise, they're very well built and actually do make good power supplies for something at this level. I mean you don't have to go super fancy, I mean if you are going to go super fancy with power supplies you may as well just buy a better DAC to begin with. The idea is that you can use this, you could use the power supply just from a USB port from your computer but it may not work so well, it may be very noisy, it may not be good quality. I recommend, again, the iPhone charger worked out very well and that's what I used for this review. Other phone chargers may not be so good, so be cautious there. Cheap USB chargers I don't recommend. Anyway, onto the inputs and outputs. It can be a little bit confusing, as I've said in other videos, where the outputs and the inputs use similar kind of connectors. Well, let's start with the one you're probably most likely to use, which is the USB input. Now, if you want the full kind of options where you can go up to super high res or do super oversampling, all the fancy stuff with that, well, then you're going to use the USB. I think at the $200 mark, people generally aren't taking quite such an interest in that, so I'm not going to go into that in super detail. Generally, these days, whereas, you say, 5, 10 years ago, USB inputs tended to be kind of average to poor quality, and people were using like noise isolation and other features to improve them over a direct connection from a computer. Nowadays, they're pretty good. So I didn't find any benefit necessarily from using, say, the coax input to using the uh, USB input. I mean, you might, but again, if you start spending money on tweaks and that kind of thing, buy a better DAC to begin with maybe is a good idea. But all the same, you may be interested, you might want to do that. You know, some people will do buy something basic like this and, and uh, kind of supercharge it, something I'm going to talk about a little bit later. But all the same, your other inputs are your coax input. Now the coax is Sony Philips Digital Interface, or SPDIF, and it's one that, if you weren't already aware, when CD players ended up being split into a CD transport and a digital to analog converter, it's the connection they used, or one of them in fact. And some motherboards have this, some devices have this. If you're one of those people who might be connecting, say, a CD player, which may be rare, or some particular sound card, you might want to try using that. It does require a 75 ohm cable, one that has a particular characteristic impedance so that you don't get signal reflections and don't cause issues with the connection. Now, the other version, well, it has a coax digital output as well, so you can actually pass through on that quite interesting. But one of the other connections is Toslink Optical, and this is basically the optical version of SPDIF. Now I've talked about this in other videos, Optical has the advantage of being electrically isolated from your computer or whatever device you're using, and that can mean less noise pass through and a better quality connection. 
The downside is that optical has extreme amounts of jitter. Now, while the circuitry in most DACs these days can connect correct for jitter very adequately, doing so they can generate a lot of noise which gets dumped into the output and that can sound really harsh. However, now it is solvable, there's a company I found in Canada called Sys Concept who make a 1300 strand optical cable. So instead of one big wide strand with uh, light bouncing all around inside, using a number 1300 very fine strands, it eliminates that problem and allows it to connect up to 192K high res through the optical reliably from a computer. I highly recommend them. There's a valid science be behind this and it can make optical a really good connection. And they're, they're a worthy investment and they're not super expensive like some high-end glass cables. Anyway, uh, there's the, that's for the input. For the outputs, you have your analog RCA, single-ended output as we generally call them, and your balanced XLR outputs. One of the hyped things about this was that it's for 200 bucks. It's the, the cheapest $200 balanced DAC or was until shit audio released their $200 balance deck. But anyway, uh, you do have the choice of balanced or single-ended. At this kind of price level, I wouldn't worry too much about, oh, I must use balanced. It use whatever is convenient. For example, if I was to use this with active speakers because it has volume control, I might use long balanced cables because they're less likely to pick up noise from my you know surrounding equipment, like computer equipment and stuff I have. And all this stuff I have here, which is very good at, at putting noise through cables in my experience and requires some careful consideration. But, you know, let's say you're buying this to hook up to, say, a tube amp. Uh, you, you know, tube amps usually very rarely have balanced inputs, so you may as well just use the uh, single-ended output and, and be happy with that. So that's kind of a basic overview of the features. And, well, the thing you're all waiting for is, what did I think of the sound? So I listened with the LAQXD1 and compared it to these other DACs that I have here through my Master 9 headphone amp, which is designed to be kind of dead flat, neutral, clear sounding amp, which gave me a very good impression of how the particular DAC sounds versus, you know, others. And straight off the bat, the sound quality was very impressive. And I have something interesting to say about that later in the video, in fact. Now... Of course, it's not going to match, you know, some of the higher end stuff like the Mojo and what have you, not my high end DAX, ultimately. But at that kind of price level, using an iPhone charger, generally it was pretty good. Now, the difference between it and maybe other kinds of DAX is very subtle. And it's, it comes down to kind of design goals and sometimes the DAC chip as well. You know, it's a whole combination of all of them. But generally, these DACs are designed to measure very well. And the differences in sound between them are quite subtle. But those subtleties I put down to being things like the SMSL M200 uses an AKM flagship DAC chip and this uses a flagship ESS Sabre chip. And the differences between those to me are kind of subtle but I describe them like I call this the coffee table analogy. Imagine having you have a coffee table that's either glass, wood or metal. Now it's going to be do the same job but each has a different kind of feeling. The AKM deck, such as in the M200, are kind of like your glass coffee table. It's kind of smooth, clear kind of sound, maybe not quite totally transparent. The uh, wood coffee table is like the Burr Brown deck chips like you find in IFI gear. It's a little bit more organic, a little bit, got a little bit of character in there, and you know, but you've, you've got the, basically the, the uh, imperfections of the wood in there. Whereas the ESS Tech, is more like metal, and that's what the uh, LAQXD1 has in there. It's a little bit more kind of sharp, clear. It, somebody described it as making singers sound like they're younger, and it has sometimes can be a little bit too sharp and too clear, especially in lower end gear where there may be a little bit more jitter in the system, there may not be as clean a power supply. It can sound a little bit flat and uninvolving sometimes, and I think that's the main. I mean, compared to higher end stuff, that's the main fault I find in cheaper DACs. Is the sound can be a little bit flatter, a little bit less, have a little bit less depth and involvement. And uh, but generally, that's where, you know, that's where people end up buying higher end gear, or maybe buying something like the cord gear, or a ladder DAC where they find that a little want something a little bit more kind of euphonic sounding, even if it isn't so perfect. So in that, but generally the performance with this using an iPhone charger was pretty good. I listened to it through, you know, using a, a Rune as my source, using the USB straight out of a Mac Mini sitting under the desk here, using, a, you know, PCM and DSD. Although DSD files, as I've always said, are very huge and they may smooth out the sound a little bit, but they take up a huge amount of space. 
And of course, space being a premium and backing all that up can be a lot of trouble. I recommend this as an aside, a company I've used for many years. If you do end up backing up your computer, Backblaze will give you completely unlimited and unthrottled backup, literally unlimited as much as you can upload even petabytes for a flat fee for one computer for one month or one year. So I highly recommend checking them out if you're interested in a completely unlimited backup solution. Literally, I have terabytes backed up with no issue. And you've got a 30 day free trial to back up as much as you like to see how it goes. And you can you can spend a long, your first backup can go for months if necessary. Literally, no kidding, unlimited. I do highly recommend them. Check out that link and sign up and try it out if you haven't already. And they, you can literally can save you if you have your computer and all your backups destroyed on premises. Now, I generally listen to most of the time CD quality files as you know, CD quality files are the most common available online through streaming services or on my own computer and some high res. Nowadays, kind of in the older, you know, Sabre based DACs, there was a bit of a difference using high res files. They sounded a bit smoother. DSD especially, as I said, sound can sound a little bit smoother. But nowadays, even the basic CD quality files sound really good through these the high end DAC chips that are available in these uh, DACs. So you don't necessarily need high res to get listening enjoyment. That being said, the kind of slightly sharper sound of the Sabre DAX can be a little bit grating kind of for some people. Some people, I've got friends who really don't like them, prefer kind of the smoother sound of the uh, uh, things like the AKM based DAX or the, the Burr Brown DAX. And, you know, that can be with some modern pop music, which isn't with a mastering can make it sound a little bit harsh. I found that maybe a touch more grating versus, say, the M200, which was a touch more kind of smooth, as I've said, that kind of like glass like smoothness, which was preferable for some tracks. Whereas the kind of more lively sharpness of this, the LAQXD1 was preferable for, for other stuff where I, I preferred that kind of sharper, clearer sound. And some people find that to, they feel like they're getting more detail, even if it is really kind of not really more detail, it does sound sharper and clearer. So those were the kind of main subtle differences. Compared to its bigger brother, the SGD1, I had nothing in it. Volume level matched, I just found nothing between them. I mean, it probably comes down to the power supply. If you had a bad power supply on this, it probably wouldn't sound as good. But, you know, again, the iPhone charger did the job. And the main difference between them is you get a remote control with the SGD1, and you have the fancy volume knob and the other features in there. Whereas this has a kind of fiddly interface that you have to work with if you do want to select the features. You know, if you want to select a digital filter, it's kind of, you have to know, a, you have to check the manual and the, and the, the uh, LED codes to, to know what filter you're on. And it's kind of a little bit fiddly and irritating. And so that's the kind of main jump down you get versus its older brother or one of the more expensive DACs that has a screen which gives you all the information there. One of the interesting things was, is that many years ago, most of a decade ago, I owned a DAC that was quite similar in concept. It was the Calyx DAC 24192. And it was a, like this, a single board Sabre based design, USB powered, and it was $2,000 when new, but much the same kind of thing. And nowadays the technology would be considered outdated. And like this little DAC, it was dependent on the quality of the power supply, dependent on the quality of the USB input. Nowadays, things are less dependent on the quality of the USB input as they were before. So I hooked it up with a $1,000 USB to SPDIF converter and a really good power supply. And I used it that way. And in doing so, you know, this roughly about, three, let's say three and a half thousand dollars. I don't think I paid full price for the DAC because I bought it second hand. But let's say three and a half thousand dollar equivalent DAC from, from then, nowadays, you know, I felt I was getting pretty much the same kind of quality out of this. Now, I don't have the DAC to directly compare, but the sound quality has improved that this at one tenth the price of that old DAC, at least at retail, I felt was kind of comparable in my memory of the sound quality. It shows how much things have improved. Now, also in the high end, they've improved considerably as well. So we're not talking about completely destroying the high end DACs. I mean, when you hear a high end system, it's just magical. So in that, it's still, you know, with the high quality music I listen with very often, say from David Chesky and Nader DSD and others, it still sounds a little bit kind of flat, a little bit uninvolving, and you can't hear some of the subtle details that I'm used to hearing through the higher end stuff. But still, I mean, for a lot of mainstream music, it did sound pretty good. And I think if you're one of those people who you're watching this video because this might be the first, you know, genuine DAC you're going to buy and you've never spent this much money on audio gear, you're going to find something like this very satisfying. 
But if you're someone like me who's experienced higher end stuff like this chord mojo, which just prevent, presents more depth and more kind of nuance to the music, then you're gonna find it maybe a touch flat sounding. So it really depends again on the critical things, the music you listen to and what you're used to hearing and what you're not used to hearing. And really a lot of the difference comes down to features as much as the subtle differences between the sounds of them. So what I tend to recommend, I mean these decks tend to sound a little bit kind of sharp and sometimes a little bit too sharp and clear. I recommend, as I've said before in other videos, pairing up something, so there's a, have this Cavalli tube hybrid down here. Now as I said at the beginning, okay you're only going to be using the single ended output of the DAC and people worry oh my I'm going to use it to its full potential the difference is going to be so small you're not really going to notice it if you do notice it at all and you'd have to use high quality music and high quality gear to really drill in on, on kind of the differences anyway I would just get it and use it with whatever you want to set it up with I mean if I have active speakers I would use the balanced inputs if they have them because I'll be using long cables and I don't want noise issues going to the speakers and that's the most ideal if you're using a tube amp and of course it only has single ended input then just use that but the slightly euphonic sound of the tube amp even if it isn't measuring quite as well as the the DAC does probably will balance things out nicely that it will make for a very nice simple listening combination and that's the kind of thing I recommend for musical enjoyments because we don't listen to test tones test tones indeed show us for the manufacturer actually whether things are performing as they should and whether there are any issues in the design they're not really for people to make sweeping judgments on whether gear is good or bad so that's the LAQXD1 and I hope that was an informative video for you. Don't forget to subscribe and like and if the video and also hit that bell button so that you're notified when I am releasing another video. Also don't forget to check out Backblaze if you haven't already. I highly recommend the service and it could really save you in the future if you do have a disaster and all your backups at home or at your business as they do have business versions are knocked out. So. As always, thanks to everyone who helped me out. If you weren't already aware, these videos are made possible by the names of the people you see on screen, as well as many other people whose names you don't see. And thanks to them, I'm able to continue making these videos and give my impressions and advice and everything on products and audio in general. If you'd like my direct buying advice, you know, it's just a couple of bucks a month, like buying me a coffee once in a while. And for that, I'll happily help you out in choosing the right gear for you. And that can save you way more than a couple of bucks a month. So do click on the link in the description or go to amos.io slash support to, to join in our little community of supporters and chat to me and ask me questions directly. So as always, thanks once again for watching and I'll see you online.